Today we have the uh, privilege of having uh, Peter Hoffman join us. Uh, he actually joined us last night for dinner and he spent the day visiting different members in the uh, center. So his work focuses on um, system dynamics, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, he is the founding director um, of the Social Systems uh, Design Lab at the Brown School at WashU. He's also associate professor of practice. Um, and it was wonderful getting to know him at dinner last night because uh, we discussed a range of topics ranging from you know, how one approaches uh, systems thinking, applies system science to not just obesity, but all different types of uh, chronic diseases and, and public health problems. So we're very fortunate to have him to talk about his work, uh, which is a unique com combination of, of theory and also applying it and translating it to uh, policymaking as well. So without further ado, thank you for joining us. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, so I will um, um, sort of give a broad overview both of the, so the background and the context. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that if, if folks who are on the webinar have questions to, uh, here's the email um, address. So uh, just briefly in terms of the Brown School Social System Design Lab, um, so our mission is to um, develop the, uh, the science and application of system dynamics in communities. Um, and so it's really moved very quickly into an area of really thinking about community engagement and modeling and community-based participatory um, work. And mostly what we do is system dynamics, uh, simulation modeling, and then also deploy uh, group model building. And the application areas have mostly focused on social determinants of health in a number of areas like obesity, cancer, child maternal health, intimate partner violence, and modern contraceptive use. And then we teach courses in system dynamics, group model building, and do professional development. And this is actually a picture of what the lab looks like when we're doing a workshop. They're actually looking at a they're building a, uh, some structure around service cliffs and delivery systems around transition uh, from youth to adult services. These are just some of the organizations we par partner with um, in the US and, and elsewhere. Um, so let me just sort of briefly go over then sort of what we'll be talking about uh, today. Um, I like to sort of start by talking about sort of how do we frame complex uh, system problems and questions. I find we were just sort of having a, a, actually a pretty terrific conversation uh, about um, just before this about how we how we do this and what the problems are when we when we don't do this well, um, and I like to begin there. Um, um, so they'll be a little bit theoretical. And then thinking about some of the methods we use in system science to answer these questions, and I'm going to focus then more specifically on system dynamics and what I think system dynamics brings to the to the table. Um, that moves us into a situation where we can start talking about um, understanding complexity of social determinants, and I think there's specific characteristics that are interesting. And then how do we go about uh, studying social determinants by engaging communities? I'll give you an example from our childhood obesity work. So that's the overview of the plan. And I know you already have some familiarity, I think a number of you, with system dynamics and agent-based modeling and a variety of techniques. And so I debated about sort of removing some sides, but I thought maybe uh, maybe some did not have that exposure yet. Um, and even if you did, I always thought it was nice to, I enjoy hearing um, others sort of present stuff and hearing it um, from a different perspective. So I like to begin with this picture. This is a Jackson Pollock painting or a picture of a Pol Pol Jackson Pollock painting. I think this is sort of reality. Uh, lots and lots of different connections overlaid. Um, and if you try to look at this uh, in its entirety, um, in the actual painting, it is, it is overwhelming, like reality. Um, and so we necessarily have to simplify reality just to make it through the world. Um, and so we perceive the world in a certain way, and then we act on the world. And what mediates our perceptions and our behaviors are our mental models. And this is, this is a notion that I will later come back to is pretty central to system dynamics, uh, but it's not exclusive to system dynamics. We talk about mental models in lots of other areas. Um, and I think about a mental model as, as, a, as a, a cognitive representation of, of some sort of problem you manipulate in your head, trying to figure out what the best solution is. Uh, so you might think about walking around this building. If you want to get from one point to another point, what are your different options? and then trying to sort of calculate that out and then selecting a choice. 
And what gets us in trouble, uh, lots of times things are fine. We don't need to worry about mental models being flawed. But when things start to go wrong in some, certain types of situations, um, we, we can often sort of diagnose the problem as being um, we're using the wrong mental model. So we, we apply more effort thinking it's going to be more effective uh, because we work from a certain mental model. Um, that makes the situation worse. And so one example you can think of if you're in an argument uh, with somebody and I'm, I'm, I'm arguing and I think, well, maybe if I just explained it a little bit better, they would, they would understand and agree with me, um, except my mental model is that it's a not, they're not understanding this, uh, so that's driving the behavior. And yet um, we, we've been probably all been in an argument like that and you realize that they understand you quite well at the end or you're on the receiving end. So we try to sort of focus this on the mental models. So that's sort of where I really want to begin. And there are different kinds of problems we could have about our mental models. Um, I like to use this framework. This is adapted from Burrell and Morgan and, and uh, David Lane and uh, Jackson, uh, Michael Jackson and others. Um, on the horizontal axis, um, so Burrell and Morgan were interested in thinking about um, they were looking sort of for their next big research study um, in the sociolo sociology of organizations. And, and so they, um, they, they were trying to design an empirical study that would answer a big question in sociology. What they realized was that the big questions, they uh, were not answerable within a uh, particular empirical study because the disagreements were about parad were sort of paradigms, disagreements about the underlying assumptions. And on the horizontal axis, you have different views of social science. So over here, you have objective views of social science. You believe there are certain facts. They exist objectively. You can study them. Um, on, the, on the left side here, you see uh, subjective views of science. You, uh, reality is socially constructed. It's intersubjective agreement. And we can think about the range of social science methods we might apply across the spectrum. And then you also have differences on the vertical in terms of what are you, what are you trying to do in terms of, of what's your idea about society? Are you trying to sort of improve the existing status quo, uh, sort of more of a regulation view, or are you trying to change the structure of the system in some fundamental way? And so there were differences in, in how people understood organizations that way. Um, and this, is, this has been actually used, this type of framework has been used not just to think about organizational studies, but different methods in system science and where they land and systems approaches to management. Um, I have used this to think about, well, there are actually different kinds of problems we might, might be thinking of. Typically, a lot of our research fits into this category of analysis problems. We have difficulty finding or adjusting parameters in systems. Uh, we have difficulty figuring out where the leverage points are, that is, where are the, the real places where small changes could have big effects. Uh, how big should the buffers be um, in terms of, of, if you think about a distribution system or uh, a food uh, system, or what are the impacts of delays and changing delays? Um, so a lot of our traditional sort of research would fit into this. And, and, and if this is sort of the problem you're facing with uh, an area like childhood obesity, um, the, knowing the right answer is the most important piece of that. And then you think about after that, if we, once we have the right answer, what is it we do? Um, but you could also end up in certain situations where, where the real problem isn't so much that we don't have sort of the right scientific answer about leverage points, but we have so much conflict and disagreement, we can't uh, even move forward on something. If we could even move forward on the wrong answer, that would be better than having um, uh, no agreement whatsoever. Um, so I think in, in Missouri, if, uh, there was a problem, for example, where if you, if you removed a child uh, from foster care, nobody really knew who was supposed to make sure that that child got their eyeglasses. Uh, so the child's in foster care, they've been removed from the home, they need eyeglasses. But because people are disagreeing about who should get them eyeglasses, the child doesn't get eyeglasses for months. It, it doesn't really matter if, it's, if the best decision is a certain division or department or the nonprofit, just somebody um, getting that child eyeglasses would have solved that problem. Um, and so a lot of times I think of these as coordination problems. You can also think about uh, sometimes we analyze a system and there's actually no objectively desirable outcome. There are variations of bad outcomes, uh, but we actually can't achieve what we would like to see. Uh, so you could talk about, for example, we might be able to slow uh, within a certain period of time the increase in diabetes. Uh, 
um, how fast it'll grow, but we may not be able to decrease the actual rate of diabetes. Uh, and that might be something due to the inherent structure of the system um, as we currently understand it, or we may be able to lower the, uh, slow the growth of, of cost of healthcare, but not actually reduce uh, healthcare costs. That would, might be a limitation of a system. And when that's the case, then we need to think about restructuring the system in some fundamental way. We need to think about altering how we think about it, what the goals of the system are, how the feedbacks are structured. And so that would be a re restructuring problem. Um, and then there are situations where systems often are sort of changing so quickly um, that really, you're, you, and, and people don't understand systems, so you're really thinking about um, how, do we, how do we learn more effectively about systems. So a lot of the systems thinking literature, for example, really targets um, trying to address what we call learning problems, or how does a community in rural India, for example, adapt to very rapid uh, change, or in China, um, uh, I was just in Singapore last week, and, and people were talking about the kinds of changes that would be needed in order to be able to address uh, services for uh, older adults. And while you could introduce new technologies to address that, the real question was, can our, can our patients, can our communities actually ad uh, adapt to those changes in service delivery systems fast enough? And that would be a learning problem. So one of the reasons I like to emphasize this is that you, you would build different models um, to help us understand different types of problems. And the criteria for a good model uh, of a system really depends on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Um, if, I'm, if I'm solving an analysis problem, it means that getting the answer right, getting the estimates right, getting the projections right, being able to predict prevalence and test that is really important. If it's a coordination problem or more in this, in this region, it's probably less important that the model is actually producing results. It's more important that the group can agree to it, even if, with limitations. Um, and so maybe there's less emphasis here. The buy-in, the ownership is important. If it's a learning problem, what's important is that people learn from it. Uh, and, and if they can't learn from the model and they can't use what you're trying to teach them, then it's not a good model. And if it's a restructuring problem, then the question is whether or not people can actually uh, use the model in some way to redesign the system in some, in some important ways. And, and so those are the criteria when you, when you ask me, for example, it, well, is this a good model? It really depends on the purpose. Um, and the cost often associated with these different models is, is quite different. So an analysis problem generally is more expensive than a learning, um, uh, a model that you're developing for a learning problem. And um, conversely, if, if you've spent a lot of money developing an analysis, uh, um, a model that's going to solve an analysis problem. But the main insight is that people can see the system. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure that's the best use of those resources. That's probably something more like a coordination problem or learning problem, and maybe you could use some other tools. So that's, that's one point I want to make here. We can also think about uh, then the different types of insights we could gain from models. And some insights could be uh, more important or helpful at different stages. So at the very top, simply awareness that there's a system. When we talk about system science, we, we, we presuppose a lot of times that people understand what systems are. We think about a number of components that are interacting over time. Uh, but I remember a two-day meeting uh, at one point uh, with people who are interested in childhood obesity and system science. And at the end of that meeting, we had one group pointing their finger at industry and saying it's industry's fault, and the other group pointing their finger at public health and saying, well, until you can get people wanting healthier food, we can't market healthier food. And we had lost the idea that we are locked in a system and that we're, our actions are affecting each other, and we're thinking of this in a very linear view. So even, even among system scientists and people gathering, sometimes this is hard to keep in, in, in focus. As you move further down, you think about what are the components, how the components related through feedback, how do people think about the system, where could you intervene? As the systems get more complex, it actually becomes harder to figure out where you could intervene. You can come up with lots of ideas, and if you ask people to brainstorm, one of the things that I often see is that people have maybe 10 or 20 or 30 different ideas, but they all load on the same basic part of the system. So we have 20 ways of intervening in the same place, and maybe none of them are going to be effective. They, they would be effective at pushing that particular place in the system, but, but that's a low leverage point, and so none of them are going to actually be able to change population health. Move further down, you get deeper insights and like, what's the generic structure of the system? You see patterns of, of, of structures that, are, that emerge and, and being able to identify them. What systems can generate dynamic behavior? Where are the leverage points? So where are the actual leverage points? Where are those places where small changes can have big effects? It's really hard to figure out. Um, 
just by, by think, trying to think through it, you need formal models to that. And when do things like initial conditions or boundary conditions matter? And then really being able to develop rigorous explanations is a fairly deep insight about a system. Um, it doesn't always mean that the deeper insights are what's needed. Some, sometimes simply helping people visualize the system is enough to, for example, address a coordination problem. Other times you really need to sort of work more down in this region. And you would normally have answers to this. So we have informal answers to these different types of insights. If asked you why is this happening, most people could give a, a type of explanation, whether it's a good explanation or not, that's a, that's a different matter. Or if I said, what's the system here, most people could give you an idea of what, what some parts of the system. So we're generally trying to sort of improve our understanding, our mental models of, of some of these insights by building models. And, and one of the points I want to make here is we want to build different models for different types of insights. So if your goal is simply to, to help people recognize that there are different components in a system and what the system might be, maybe just a picture is good enough. There are certain techniques where people have a conversation, they're drawing pictures, and they're conveying the idea that there's a system. If you're trying to figure out what the generic structure is and where you might intervene, then you're going to need something like graphical models or causal maps, a little bit more formal. If you're down here, you really need to think about formal simulation models. I don't believe there's another way to do that. Um, so if you really want to be able to test where the leverage points are, you're going to need something like a computer simulation. So there are different kinds of models we could build, and I, I like to organize this when we think about system science as sort of roughly three different kinds of hypotheses. There are others as well. You could think about spatial hypotheses and so forth in GIS. Um, if I'm thinking about you know, trying to understand what's the difference between scaling up, successful scale up of a, of a childhood obesity intervention versus one that sort of starts but then it doesn't succeed, I'm trying to explain these, the differences between these two different curves. Uh, well, one kind of explanation I might have is about the structure of the social network. Maybe I have a diffusion theory, and, and um, the structure of the social network turns out to be important. Um, I could also think about it in terms of the rules of the actors and how they adapt to change. Uh, maybe that's what's driving some of this behavior. Uh, or I could think about it in terms of the feedback mechanisms. Uh, what are the feedback loops that are driving uh, one pattern and, and distinguishing another? The thing we want to point out here is that we've got different tools for different kinds of hypotheses. So we would generally use social network analysis to test questions about how does the social network structure, for example, help us explain the differences between a successful versus unsuccessful scale up? Or how do the rules of the actors and how they adapt to situations help us understand the differences here? Or how do the feedback loops help us understand the differences between these two different behaviors? So we could have the same phenomena, but the way we would try to explain it would depend on the kind of hypothesis we're generating and asking. Um, and so if you ask me as a system dynamicist, I'm going to give you a, a feedback um, hypothesis. If you asked uh, someone like Ross Hammond, he's going to give you uh, an explanation about rules and how rules might adapt and, and so on. Um, so these, these, are, these are different ways we want to think about. Now I'm just going to focus on, on, on system dynamics. Um, and, and get into a little bit more specifics about, about that because that's primarily what we're using when we engage communities. So there, there's, uh, this is a terrific article by George Richardson looking at, at what, what really are the foundations of system dynamics. And I think if you're writing a grant, this is the kind of definition you should be thinking about um, and, and looking toward. There are different definitions of system dynamics involving computer simulation and so forth, but this is the one I think that ties in a, in the sort of most crisp way into to, to how you think about hypotheses. And Richardson draws a distinction between systems thinking. So, so he thinks about systems thinking mainly as the mental effort to uncover endogenous sources of behavior and system dynamics as the use of informal and formal um, models with computer simulation to understand endogenous sources of behavior. So I'll give you some examples of what we mean by informal maps and formal models with computer simulations in a second. And the other piece we want to focus on is this term endogenous sources of system behavior. So what, is, what are we trying to do there? Well, in the same paper, uh, Richardson sort of goes back, reviews what Jay Forrester, the founder of System Dynamics, talks about. And one of the things he, he reminds us um, that Forrester talked about is, is, is Forrester actually had sort of four aspects of what Jay Forrester thought about as system dynamics, and he ranked them in terms of their level of importance. At the very top was this endogenous perspective, that Jay Forrester thought that system dynamics brings an endogenous perspective. That was the, that was the most important piece. 
Next most important would be the stock or the level state variables that represent accumulations. Um, then you start thinking about the activities that are represented by flows and rates. And then the last piece being uh, the use of computer simulation. Um, so what's, what's important about this list is that the most important feature of system dynamics is this endogenous perspective. And that's actually the most accessible part for a community to engage in through diagramming tools. If this ver list were reversed and we had simulation up top, we probably wouldn't have uh, group model building or community-based uh, system dynamics in the way that it exists today. But the fact that we can give people actually a pretty good experience and be able to talk from an endogenous perspective gives us a lot of, of purchase when working in diverse communities. So here's an example of, of a informal, uh, some informal causal maps. These are actually drawn by participants who don't have any prior training in system dynamics. Um, the one on the left is actually uh, from some, uh, it's, from a low, it's from a community center with some low income uh, residents in St. Louis. And they were asked to, to essentially draw some structure uh, of what does it take to raise a child in St. Louis uh, in, in support of a design of an early intervention program. And you see there are lots of feedback loops. Here's one that talks about education, influencing employment, employment feeding back and influencing education. You've got stress and money, stability of housing, uh, churches. Um, in this particular group, you had both, um, you had from, from teen moms to teen dads. They weren't uh, teen moms or, or teen dads of the same child. They just happened to be uh, parents. And you had a sort of a, the fathers came up and they talked about some of the features they, they thought important and, and the moms came up and they explained uh, what they thought as being important. So you had a nice dialogue. And this is the, the result of, this is the second of a 60 minute exercise. So this is the second workshop and it's about 60 minutes of work. Um, and, and this is pretty neat. So this is, you can, you can learn a lot from, from something that's relatively efficient. And this is what we call a causal loop diagram in system dynamics. Uh, this is looking at maternal health and, and particularly maternal mortality um, and a three delays framework. It's drawn by some folks from um, Honduras and um, they're looking at, uh, this is a stock and flow diagram where each box represents a state and uh, these are pipes or transitions from one state to another state and they've mapped in the interventions. And it's actually a pretty, both of these diagrams are pretty close to being grammatically correct from a system dynamics point of view. Um, so these are examples of informal causal maps that are very informative about how participants uh, view their system. Um, this is an example of a formal computer simulation model. And one of the things that you will notice in this set of conventions, it's actually pretty close to the stock and flow type of diagram that participants might draw. Um, so we can, one of the features of system dynamics and the visual conventions is that you can go from stock and flow diagrams participants draw to simulation models relatively quickly. Um, this is a particular kind of con uh, formal simulation model. It's called a concept model. Uh, it's a term that uh, George Richardson coined. So concept models are small models that are used specifically to introduce concepts of system dynamics, like stocks and flows, feedback loops, um, within the context of a particular uh, subject domain. Um, so this is, this is looking at obesity, normal weight, and norms. Uh, they are deliberately wrong. So they invite participants to critique them. I'm going to ask you in a second after I explain this, what's wrong with this? Um, I think uh, we were talking uh, last night and, and, and earlier today with some doctoral students about, you know, uh, and postdocs, you know, it seems like it takes a long time to build simulation models. Certainly that's true for some kinds of models. It might take many years to get it right. But there are other models that are very small that are very productive and very quick. And I think actually a very good kind of model to begin in the beginning of research. This is something we do with teams when we start working with them is to develop a concept model, both as a way of developing that transdisciplinary team and understand each other's language, but also to make sure we've got the key concepts that we want to put into a grant and so forth. And I think for doctoral students, this is actually a, a really good exercise, um, both to figure out the concepts um, uh, that you want to have represented and see whether or not it works. So in this particular structure, we have a stock of, of, of children who are, and, and, or people who are normal weight, and we have a stock of people who are overweight. Um, they gain weight by transitioning from normal weight to overweight, and what drives that is an energy balance. And that's influenced in this model only by a weight norm, 
and the weight norm is, a, is strictly a function in this case of the number of people who are normal weight relative to the number of people who are overweight and then people leave the system um, um, through mortality. Um, and it has mace, most of the essential feedback loops. So, so what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this one? You have normal weight, overweight people. You have people being born in the normal weight diet, normal weight, some transition to being overweight, and then some die as overweight. What, what's, what's one thing that's wrong with this? You can never lose weight. There's no dieting here, right? Uh, th there's no no way to lose weight. You once you gain weight, you you stay in the overweight. What else? So there's not there's nothing else. There's 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 maybe an increase in in um, in risk in terms of energy balance, but there's nothing else that's driving this. There's no change in physiology. There's no metabolic rate. Nothing. Anything else? In, in this structure, also. Um, People, everybody's born normal weight. There's no, nobody's born overweight. Okay, so there's no, there's no, there's no inflow here. There are lots of things that could be wrong with this. If we we're doing this as a group model building, we'd actually spend probably about 10 to 15 minutes just sort of figuring out what's wrong with this. Um, and it's not meant to be a, a conceptual model that you'd put into an actual grant. It's simply meant to be a model that, that gets a conversation going about what should be in the model, what should not be in the model, what features you're trying to capture. Well, in this kind of model, we can simulate it. And so if we put in, for example, births and as well as allow people to lose weight, in this scenario here, um, you see an increase in the proportion of the population over a long period, 100 years in this case, gaining weight. Um, and just remember, this is just a pedagogical model to introduce system dynamics. Um, and then we can run various scenarios um, and by testing various kinds of interventions here. Um, we're assuming an increase in essentially the, the available um, uh, calories that are available like for, from uh, sugar, sweetened beverages and so forth. Uh, but what you'll notice here is that these are uh, interventions. This is, um, you have interventions that um, encourage people to lose weight. You have interventions that would change the norm through maybe social marketing as well as, as uh, changing the energy balance that's available through soda taxes or removing sugar-sweetened beverages from communities, and then also reducing mortality of people who are overweight, which is this red line. And what you'll notice is that when we try to, when we reduce the, the, um, a couple things to notice in these in these trajectories if you haven't seen this type of thing before one is that the um, the intervention here reduces mortality but the and as a consequence the proportion of people overweight increases uh, so that that actually makes the situation worse um, and these three trends here this this um, the base run and the two interventions here they they are numerically different from the general trend but uh, and this one's maybe more alarming, but they still have the same basic qualitative behavior of increasing, whereas these other two interventions here actually decrease the traje trajectory. So a lot of times in system models and system dynamic models, you'll see a lot of discussion about these kinds of trends, and that's fine. I, I think that's okay, um, but it's somewhat limiting because you really want to take advantage of these models to find a difference like from this base run to something that alters the trajectory. That's where these models become the most interesting. And that's what I'd consider a leverage point. Um, and then we can also look at the actual mortality. When we reduce the mortality, this is assuming we could do that instantly, you see that there's a short-term decrease, but then you see it comes, it rebounds as mortality, uh, as the stock here increases, whereas the others end up being better. So, so these are examples of, of this is an example of a formal simulation model, just a concept model to illustrate some of this. One of the consequences of these models, and one of the things that we've learned by building uh, system dynamic models in particular, is that the structure of the system has a huge impact, much more so than the initial conditions in many cases on the system. 
and, and this poses a, a special challenge when we start thinking about social determinants of health at the community level. Uh, because we have both a lot of detail complexity. We have many different components at different levels of scale, different actors. We have heterogeneity of individuals. We have different kinds of organizations. Um, you could have a number of different villages or communities, and they would each have different kinds of livelihood strategies, and it, it becomes uh, quite challenging to handle all of this. You also have a lot of dynamic uh, complexity, so you have communities that are in different trajectories, um, and those both are at play when we're thinking about social determinants and, and that we have to be able to think about both. So one way I think about this is, is then trying to sort of break this down and you can think about how complex is the system in terms of if you're going to try to build a model to understand this. Well, one way you could characterize or one dimension you could carry out, characterize the, the complexity of a model would be how many variables do you need? Um, you can also think about how many actors or different types of actors do I have. Uh, so I can think about like, okay, I've got children and then I have children at different ages and then children are nested within families and the families are nested within blocks. And then I have organizations and I have uh, corner stores and I have suppliers and distributors and you can keep adding the number of actors. And then you also have a number of, of possible models that you need to specify. Um, so there could be, uh, you know, maybe you start out with one model, but you realize it could be actually a, a, a whole category of models that are equivalent that are all able to explain the same behavior. So if you're familiar with structural equation modeling, we would talk about this as model equivalence, and you have to rule out equivalent models. And the more complex the system, the more elements, actors, and so forth, and the more uncertainty there is, and particularly about socially constructed models, the more, uh, the larger the number of possible models you have to search through to be able to, to, to figure out what they are. Well, there's a limited amount of time, both in terms of computation and research, and so we can think about, I call this the uh, computational complexity boundary. You could spend your time sort of trying to eliminate a lot of these possibilities, um, uh, but then you don't have as much time to do the simulation models, um, and, and there's a, there's a trade-off between having a lot of models you have to search through uh, to find the right one that might be explaining the behavior, um, and then the number of, of uh, uh, actors versus the number of variables. Or if you've only got sort of a limited number of cases, you're just going to build one model, uh, you're more in this region. Um, and the point I want to make here is that different tools are good at solving sort of different places in this. So group model building is very good at helping to reduce the number of models you actually have to consider to build a model. That's what we use. We try to reduce the the d dimensional complexity of a system by engaging communities and rule out a number of different possibilities. Agent-based modeling is really good if you've got a lot of different actors uh, and a limited number of variables. Uh, and the system dynamics tends to do better when you've got a lot of variables but a limited number of actors. And then, there, of course, there are regions where these things can overlap. So when we think about then what is group model building, um, it's a method of involving participants and other stakeholders in the modeling process. And, and the modeling process here really goes from problem conceptualization to formulating the model that could be with the, the rules in an agent-based model or it could be the feedback loops in the structure in a system dynamics model. But mostly it would be uh, from a system dynamics perspective as we do practice it, then to doing the policy analysis and implementation. Um, some would argue that if you're just doing one of these, but not all of them, it's not really group model building. You're not really involving people building a model. It's more what people would call participatory systems modeling. Um, and so generally, people have reserved the term for group model building. Actually, you want to involve people in building the model. And there are a number of reasons you want to do this. One is uh, this idea of uh, sharing the insights. So group model building and system dynamics emerged out of the, the realization that you have these models. They have very complicated um, structures in some cases. Um, they have counterintuitive insights. And um, it, it's hard to convey the results and be persuaded by those if you haven't been involved in the modeling process. So for a long time, the modelers were learning a lot about the models. We were talking about this last night, about how you gain a lot by building models. Um, and the idea is, well, you'd like to share those insights actually with the people who are going to make decisions. Um, another reason would be developing consensus, simply getting people on the same page and, and getting to agreement. Um, it's often inherently a, a tool for designing for implementation if you're actually involving the people who are going to implement the process. And the last point is sort of the dignity of risk, which is a term that came out from a participant at one, one group model building workshop who said, you know, we're going to be the ones who are going to benefit or lose from this particular policy. We'd like to be involved. 
And what we've gradually learned uh, in, in the social system design lab is that, um, you know, actually there, there are a lot, we used to think you know, maybe only people who have a certain kind of training or background would be good for group model building. And that would be the rationalization for excluding them. But every time we've sort of tried to include groups um, and, and with different educational levels, worked across language boundaries, different communities uh, in the US around the, in the world, we pretty much found that it's pretty robust. It, it, we can involve people, and if that's the case, we should at least try to involve them so they can participate in the decision making. So now I'll talk a little bit about the specific approach we use in the, uh, in the community-based system dynamics. And basically, we have sort of three, three phases. Um, the first is really what we call problem discovery or scoping, and this is where we try to identify what kind of problem is it. Is it appropriate for system dynamics? Does it involve a dynamic problem as feedback? Um, and we try to keep this, the, the involvement and the investment here as, as, as light as possible. We don't want people to uh, get into a situation of sunk costs where they feel like they have to invest a lot to get into a project. Um, and we say, you know, if it doesn't work out, that's okay. Um, we usually try to end up with sort of a one-page modeling description, which is almost like an abstract or a mission statement for this model, and we go back to that and it kind of works like a contract. Second phase, we, if we decide we want to move forward and we've got agreement and the resources, then we, we convene what we call a core modeling team. And this is a group that's actually going to design the group model building project and often becomes um, the source of having um, uh, the, where the facilitators come from. And after a modeling process begins, it becomes a steering committee for the model. So this has both a design function initially and then a governance function or advisory function in the second part. Um, then we actually do the group model building um, activity. And I would, I would emphasize this first, you know, so this, this second stage here is really quite critical. This is where we, we develop the uh, group model building protocols, where we adapt them to communities. We make sure they're culturally appropriate. We make sure they're, they're going to work uh, for the project. Uh, we make sure there's value and, and insight that's going to be relevant for participants. Um, this is where we also deal with translation issues and so forth. Um, and not having this done well is usually the source of most of the problems at this stage. Um, so you can't really see this, but I'll, I'll, what I want to emphasize here is we've got a structured process for each of these, these stages that we, we describe as scripts. So scripts are small, uh, small group structured exercises we use. Um, and initially, we're simply introducing uh, system dynamics and we're developing a, uh, what I mentioned as the modeling a group. What we might do at, at the end of an initial meeting is just project an image, uh, a Word document, and actually draft out the modeling project description. If we get the resources and we move forward, then we have essentially this sort of uh, five-step process where we initially introduce system dynamics to the core modeling team. Uh, then we start thinking about you know, who should be involved, who are the stakeholders we would want to involve, uh, how would we structure the sessions, uh, and we move into actually developing a uh, facilitation manual, and then we do a dress rehearsal. Then we actually have the group model building exercises, and there are a number of different paths that might uh, lead up to a, um, a causal map. Um, that could be an informal causal map uh, like you saw, or it could be um, more on the uh, computer generated and usually some sort of community feedback session. That might be the end of that particular project, um, and we might decide to uh, identify a new problem that came out of this. So sometimes we, we generate sort of new research questions here, and this feeds back. Um, other times we move forward and we build the simulation models, and, and sometimes we find that some of the assumptions that, were, that came out of the group model building exercise, people didn't maybe understand the conventions, they were mixing assumptions which, which folks didn't fully understand. Uh, we might introduce a, a board game to help clarify some of that and then go back and revisit the structure um, and sort of work our way through this. To give you a sense of what each of these stages take, um, this usually is about two to three hours and at, at most, although sometimes uh, if a group is really stuck, uh, this is something that might you might periodically have meetings over a year, but we try to sort of really avoid that. Um, once we decide we want to move forward on a project, then a core modeling team, it, it's really, it's a tight structure. It's five two-hour meetings. The first one has to be face-to-face. -face. The next four could be essentially um, uh, uh, Skype calls or conference calls to plan out the session. And then the actual group model building sessions, um, sometimes they can be as short as a single 
90 minute workshop that could be replicated across different stakeholders and, and communities. Other times they, they might go up to be five day workshops. Maybe you have a two day workshop at one phase and then a three day workshop at a second part. Um, so this, this really varies and the specific protocol will depend on, on how you wanna work through this. So let me share a little bit. This is sort of some of the places we've been doing this type of work in different stages. Um, so you can see there's sort of a, quite a range in the United States. There's actually quite a few more places. And I'm gonna share just sort of one example from St. Louis um, in the West End uh, neighborhood, which is our childhood obesity project that's been part of Envision. Um, so Washington University, if you're familiar with St. Louis, is right here, the rivers here, uh, stadiums down here, medical schools over here, Forest Park. So this region here is the community-defined boundary of the West End, and actually the lab is right down in this southwest corner. Um, and this is the, the picture of the uh, uh, blow-up of this. Um, the community is, is pretty marginalized, even within the context of St. Louis and disparities. They lost their school, which was a big deal. Um, it's 94% African-American. Uh, the 3% other is primarily um, Asian. Uh, medium household income is about 14,000, a lot of single parents and a lot of poverty, even, even for St. Louis in general. Gives you a sense of, of what are some of the, the built environment, what it looks like in terms of there are some nice neighborhoods, but there are also uh, needles and stuff like that in here and sort of broken down areas. There's some community gardens that have emerged more recently, and this is an example of the corner stores. So what do we, what do we get from this? Well, we've had a number of sessions. We've had about over 70 people involved in the actual group model building exercise all the way from uh, children in elementary school age all the way up to older adults and providers and services, clergy, um, and so forth. And uh, through a, a, a set of exercises, we've ended up with, um, this is uh, hard to see, but this basically is, is sort of a large causal map. Um, this generally is, is, this is sort of, you could say, this is our foresight version of the model from the community, um, but to be, be honest about this, this is sort of from a research perspective, this is a challenge to sort of absorb initially. From the community's perspective, actually this was not a problem. So in a, in a 50 minute uh, presentation to parents who were involved in this process, um, who had not, um, their kids were involved, but they hadn't seen this yet. This was actually relatively easy to explain in about five to 10 minutes um, with handouts and so on. And they very quickly got into a whole discussion about community gardens, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And I'll just highlight some of the structures. At the center, we have a structure here around weight. And one of the things that we learned from this participation were some of the, the drivers of what was causing uh, both kids to lose weight, but also gain weight. So we had been focusing on, on uh, children being over, um, overweight as undesirable. And we certainly heard stories about um, girls who were uh, uh, doing crash diets and the, on, uh, and the effects of that. But we also heard about uh, stories of boys who were gaining weight to bulk up uh, because of, 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 in order to be, uh, not, to avoid bullying and so forth. And so that was an interest, that was sort of one piece here. A lot of issues around social issues with kids and parents, um, self-esteem, so psychosocial issues up here as well. Second thing we learned from this was the, the um, role of corner stores. So corner stores were initially seen as, um, sites where there was unhealthy food, tobacco, alcohol, chips, and so forth. Uh, but the main stories that emerged from, from the kids' um, um, elementary school all the way up to the young adults was that corner stores were a place where kids younger age felt safe. As they got older, the older age groups they talked about, um, they would report more that this was a place where they felt a lot of peer pressure to be cool. Um, and this is where um, they would often then be recruited into gangs. And gangs has been a, a, a recurring theme within this particular neighborhood. And one of the reasons that people are not using the parks or the sidewalks or kids playing outside. Um, and so this really, the corner stores here really functioned as a social site of, of gang recruitment in this particular neighborhood. So that was, that was the major um, theme that came out that we didn't know until we talked with at least the kids uh, using these approaches. And then the community garden structure here, what's interesting about this, um, there's sort of lots of literature about community gardens and how they might work. In this case, they're hypothesizing what the effects might be of community gardens. And, and very little of this actually has to do with um, making um, fresh fruits and vegetables available or healthier eating. Big part of it is more of the social 
um, the social learning that happens around healthy foods as well as getting to know the other kids. But the point is that this comes out of, of a relatively uh, short conversation, about 15 minutes in a in sort of a large, large room uh, in a church. And um, it also uh, talks more explicitly about what their expectations would be. Um, so those are just sort of three of the, the qualitative insights we pulled from this and, and some of the social learning. So this structure is now in the process. We have both sort of the data that we've been able then to collect around these variables and then the simulation model that's developing for each of the subsystems and then putting this together into a larger system. So although this looks like a complicated model, it's actually not too bad from a system dynamics point of view, and it, it represents sort of a broad slice of a system. Uh, we have a number of, of uh, texts. If you're interested in sort of reading more about this, um, there's, a, there's articles on group model building, um, and one of the ones we've had on, on use of group model building scripts as a collaborative tool on communities. Um, IOM report in an integrated framework for assessing the value of, of community-based um, intervent or prevention. Um, in the appendix, talks about these types of tools as an innovative a way to do this type of, of developing an integrated framework. So if you're looking for citations, that's a good one uh, for a report, uh, for a grant, for example. My colleague Gautam Yadama um, has a very nice book that came out that gives you sort of more of a systems thinking flavor, um, very sort of visual um, and with pictures looking at uh, fuel wood and, and, um, and, and um, in India where a lot of our work has been based, and then most recently my book on community-based system dynamics, which I think the center, I heard the center just purchased. Um, so uh, I, that was good. Um, and lastly, I just sort of want to close on, on this note, which is um, this is a picture of a community that was involved in a community-based system dynamics project in Andhra Pradesh. And, and um, this was the last, a picture of the last meeting, and, and uh, so the, the students we had working in the field during our, our Winter Institute uh, a couple years ago um, asked them, so what has been your experience with this? And they say, well, this is actually, you know, it's complicated, but our lives are complicated, but we also have ways of, of coordinating our activities, and this has been very helpful. And they, they um, showed them this dance, which has this very complicated pattern of, of weaving these ropes where they're going in and out. Um, and they use that as a metaphor for how they're going to tackle these complex problems. Um, so I think one of the, th the points I want to end on here is that communities actually have a tremendous amount of capacity and resilience and an ability to sort of engage in the techniques. It's mostly our own hesitations uh, and, and sort of preconceptions about their, their ability to sort of handle this that, that need to probably be challenged. I haven't really seen a problem with a community uh, being able to do this. So their lives are complex and they have to solve these issues regardless of whether they have tools like uh, from, from system science or not. And so things like at least the informal causal maps uh, can be very helpful. So I think we have time for questions. So I, I have a, a practical question about whether or not the, there are any computers brought out during the, the community uh, yeah. group modeling exercise. Do they have any role in this? Yeah, so we, we, we um, it depends on, on the actual design of the workshop. So for, for some workshops, it, it, the, the question is whether that's going to be helpful or not at the beginning of the process. So for some types of workshops, like the con we might start a workshop uh, like I mentioned, the Honduran team, we started that with a concept model. And so they're seeing a, they're seeing a computer simulation and what a computer simulation is and what it's about. And that's brought out specifically to, to sort of clarify what is it we're going for at the end of this process and what the idea of a computer simulation is. is, is uh, I would say that's generally sort of foreign to most people that we would, we would work with. And so that's, that's where it might appear initially. Um, in the, some of the work with uh, in in the West End or in villages in India, some of the other work, uh, we have not brought out computers initially. But what we find is at some point people have a reaction like, "Look, I can't I can't f tell what what do we do with this diagram? I don't know what the behavior will be would would be how I would interpret it." And uh, people get specific questions, and they get sort of interested, and they start actually sort of wanting computer simulation, or if we are asking questions, uh, 
Um, so one village at one point said, well, what do you need? Why are you asking all these kinds of questions? And the students explained why they were asking these questions and explained they were building a simulation model. And they pulled out the computer model and, and sat down with the farmers. And, and that was quite interesting. So part of the strategies is not to necessarily start off with computer simulation if you're working in rural communities or communities where, where computers are not a common technology. Um, and then only bring it in as, as it, the community is demanded and are ready. What we generally want to do is to have the, the community sort of be ready for and demand and, and sort of be interested in the computer simulation before we sort of push it. So try to make, create it, more, have it be more demand driven. And that, it's a much nicer situation. So instead of trying to explain why we need to do all these things, you, you have when a community is saying we would like to have a computer simulation model for this to understand this particular problem, it's it's much easier to be have a sort of pragmatic focus. Well, for what kinds of questions and when do you need this kind of information and what's the time horizon, um, as opposed to being it just a pure research question of, of my own interest. But it, but it really has been interesting to see where even where we didn't expect simulation to show up, it it actually gets pulled in. And then also the use of simulation games is another sort of way we do that, like a board game we would create based on the computer model. Um, <clears throat> thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, you said something relatively early on that I'm, I'm uh, trying to understand um, in my head, and I'd like you to expand on it a little bit. You were speculating about um, situations in which the, uh, I hope I get this right, but the structure of the dynamics are more important than the initial conditions. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like you to expand on or, or, or explicate that a little bit, um, particularly if you're willing to speculate on how, um, uh, what kind of situations might that arise, for example, in the study of obesity? Well, so, I, so more generally in terms of like as, as a insight about systems, so experience of building simulation models, um, we always need to, we, in order to build a model and have it run, we need the initial conditions. Um, what I find and others have found is that a lot of times, in a, at least a system dynamics model, um, those initial conditions will um, alter the they will alter the numeric behavior, but qualitatively, for example, you might still have an epidemic, or you still might have an exponential increase. All that all the initial conditions are determining is how fast it's increasing. So that's important. I mean, if you're talking about mortality, you're talking about disease and costs, and so those numbers matter to somebody. So it's not that they're insignificant, but in terms of qualitative behavior, it's it's not it's not substantial. So that, that happens a lot, but not all the time. You can't always assume that. So then there are cases where you find, um, you may have some models where the initial conditions don't really make that much of a difference. And, you, and then you know that about that particular system. But then there are other cases where the initial conditions for some state variables turn out to be really important. There's a tipping point. If you're above a certain threshold, um, you'll see the you'll see an ex like this would be very similar to the, an epidemic. You'd have an epidemic. If you're below, you won't see it. Well, at that point, you need to know where you are, um, and and that figuring that out is actually a fairly deep insight. Meaning, you, I think you need to build a simulation model um, and test that and and see when do the initial conditions of this particular model alter what we would say in terms of policy recommendations or the trajectories, the qualitative trajectories of the behavior. But they will always be numeric. Almost always will it be numerically sensitive. So I, it's not that it, it doesn't change it numerically. It's the qualitative behavior and then the policy implications. And and that would be true of I think system dynamic models. I haven't worked enough with agent based models to to really look at that question. Um, I'm just starting up with uh, system dynamics, and I'm not entirely sure whether my question would be relevant. So I'm wondering the role of stochasticity in system dynamic models. Yeah. So how do you do you usually uh, take in, take that into account, or how does that play out? So so for the most part, the models are built as deterministic models without stochastic behavior. Um, but then 
that's not a problem to introduce to stochastic behavior into into models and usually the first step would be build a deterministic model and that and it at inst stochastic components and in some systems that becomes extremely important like supply chains for example is one structure where the stochastic behavior you end up with qualitatively or sort of fundamentally different behavior patterns um, because you of, of, of the stochastic uh, features and how they're playing out in feedback loops so if you don't include it it's, it's not just that you you don't have noise it's that you're actually not seeing the, the kinds of behaviors that could emerge in a, in a, in a real system. Um, so th in, that, in that sense, it's also different than, a, say, an agent-based model. You would be build it in from the beginning. We, within a region or, or, or sort of a, a particular setting, we usually um, um, approach the community and then we'll say something like, you know, we're interested in doing a project with you. We'd like to use this particular method. Um, we talk a little bit about the method. We might do a demonstration and we ask, is this something you might be interested in? Um, if, if there's not interest in it. So sometimes we might work with an organization or community and we approach them, or someone thinks it's a good idea to use system dynamics, but they're actually not that enthusiastic about it. Uh, you know, at the end of that conversation, if they say, well, they're polite, and maybe they say maybe, but it's not, their interest isn't there, then we would sort of walk away. We wouldn't, we wouldn't force it. Um, and, um, um, probably my favorite story of that is, is some of the early work we did where we sat down with some rural farmers. They're looking at declining soil fertility. And um, we said, essentially, we would like to develop this method with you as it will work in your community uh, if you're interested. In, um, is this something you're interested in? And they had a big argument for about 45 minutes. <laughs> and then they concluded that, uh, look, if these foreigners want to burn their cash just to hear us talk about soil fertility, that's the least we could do, is at least entertain them about our stories. But very quickly, you know, what you're looking for then in that kind of case is, is some uh, example of the model. And then very quickly, people will sort of realize that you have a way of hearing them with the models that they generally appreciate. And so that creates that positive relationship that you can work from. Um, it, the first set of relationships is always that first engagement in a, in a, in a region is usually the hardest um, and you have to sort of pick the right partners but but what usually happens after that is then there's sort of a word of mouth effect or the NGO has used this for example or the nonprofit has used it in one case and wants to use it in another case and then it's much much easier and as the as your various partners in a community become uh, more involved and more sophisticated they come with better questions uh, so that we don't uh, we don't get questions anymore like we'd like you to build a pa causal map. They say we're we're tired of this We'd like to you to work with you to build a simulation model because we need to figure out where the leverage points are and And so that's kind of a fun situation to work from You mean sort of what type of capacity is needed or Yeah. People's ability to manage life and Yeah. Um, so it, it, it really, it, it varies. Um, so in the West End, uh, we have hour, hour and a half meetings, um, late afternoon, early evening. Um, for the core modeling team, it's been between every two weeks and every three weeks. And we've been able to sustain that for the last four years. Um, so that's, there's a core group there's a that that comes uh there's a little bit of transition there in, during winter um and then they come back in terms of their um in spring and summer um in places like india um if it's um if it's agricultural season like it, they had rains this this year in january um and so they were they had a chance to do some farming so um they said you know don't come to us during the day because we're out in the fields um, but we're okay with meeting you in the evenings. So 
uh, we might meet from 6 or 7 p.m. to maybe 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. and then it's a three-hour ride back uh, in the Jeep and so you're getting home around to you to your base around 1 a.m. so but we would sort of work it that way and that might be over two weeks it might be like four or five meetings like that do you, do you have a favorite example that you use in your field Dave? that you reuse do you have like a fa is there a favorite example my, that always works how this works yeah my probably my favorite example goes back to um we had um um one of our first projects, we, we, when we first started doing this in India in 2008, I mentioned this, the soil fertility um, example with the farmers. And um, the way we had initially structured that week was two weeks of two days of working with the NGO staff and introducing system dynamics. And their, this sort of workshop format and their anxiety just kept going up. And they kept saying, how are we going to take this to the people? This is mathematical. It's too technical. So we had one day in the field. Um, with the farmers, and then they got uh, pretty excited and they were motivated. So we realized it was a bad idea to do two days of workshop um, before you could see it in, in context. And so the next year, in 2009, we had um, a week in a community called Boy Pale. Um, and Boy Pale is uh, about 60 households. Um, they have an average income of about $450 uh, dollars per year per household. They live, um, it's one of three communities that's very close to the forest. Uh, there are about 20 communities in total. And this particular community depends on um, wage labor from agriculture. Uh, women were specifically targeted through microloans as a development strategy. Um, so because they will pay back the loans, except in this particular community, that development strategy interacted with their household livelihood strategy. And since there was a drought, there was no need for farm wage labor. Um, and so they were now, because they were close to the forest, they would go into the forest and collect uh, fuel wood to sell. It's a five hour trip um, that they're carrying these big uh, 50 to 60 kilos of, of um, wood. Um, and they sell them for about a dollar to dollar fifty, and they're doing this every day to help pay back these loans. And it's not everybody. So this is the average income in that community is about 450. They, they have uh, the villages look maybe something like this. Um, and, um, and they start maybe about age 13, 14, and this is something girls do, um, but they can't do this for, for a long period of time. So maybe by the mid-20s, mid late-20s, they have started to accumulate some chronic injuries as a, as a consequence of this. So it's, it's very, um, has a big impact. Uh, we did some work with them in terms of, of some causal mapping, went back and forth multiple times, trying to understand what's driving this declining. They were, the problem from their point of view was declining availability of fuel wood, which was a source of household economic security. Um, we learned about some of the dynamics. We also learned that they weren't accessing some of the programs. Um, and so there were some things we could do uh, that the NGO we worked with, Foundation for Ecological Security, they could start using this as an assessment to develop a, a relationship with this village and a program. Um, so you could say that, that was interesting, it worked as a needs assessment and as a way of developing that initial relationship, not just working with known partners. A couple of years later, when we went back and talked with them about, you know, so how have things gone? They remember the experience very positively. Um, and the story they tell is, you know, so we, a lot of the region now has regrown and so we asked them, you know, what, what's happened? Um, and my colleague got him, got him on, and, and the story they told was, well, you know, you came at a very interesting time. At the time that you came, uh, we weren't seeing ourselves as part of the forest. We were just going in there collecting. And, and this forest, when I say forest, it's not, it's more like um, the Lorax. If there was a tree, it was chopped down. It was very, very, it was arid. It was mostly dirt, and there were very few trees. So there weren't much resources. They were just going out as far as they could. I said, but at that time when you came, we started to think ourselves as part of the system. Is, that would be our, part of the system would be my language, but they would say part of the, the forest. And in combination with the, the work that FES could then start doing, they, um, impl they started to implement some of the strategies that Ellen Ostrom talks about. They cordoned off an area. They, began, they had a, a set of uh, agreements that they could begin to enforce to protect some of those areas. And that, that area has now sort of regrown. Um, They've also connected up with the, the programs and enabled uh, the NRGES program and so forth. So what's interesting about that, although we have a simulation model, that particular example, 
um, the thing that they took out of it and remembered is this endogenous perspective, seeing themselves as part of a feedback loop. Um, and, and that wasn't the only thing. I don't want to claim that, you know, we did a system dynamics intervention. They saw themselves as part of a feedback system, and then that changed behavior. But it also was not irrelevant, I guess, is, and, you know, we haven't tested that. So that, that, that was sort of one example. Um, more recently, we had an example that was interesting from, in terms of where it actually impacted policy, working with a Honduran team. Um, the ownership of the model was very, very close. So they were making decisions about the structure of this um, maternal mortality model. And at the end of that process, so they had a number of system insights. They, they had proposed initiatives, for example, to increase in institutional delivery and made investments. One insight they realized is if we just increase institutional deliveries, but we don't improve the quality of facilities, they, the term they said is we're simply shifting the mortality from one part of the system to the other part of the system. We need to invest in multiple places. Um, and so they started talking about how they would go about doing that. Um, but because they had made decisions, and this would be the this would be sort of a nuanced difference between a model that is is if you looked at it from a public health perspective in maternal mortality, neonatal mortality, you'd say, you know, neonatal mortality is missing from that. That's a huge mistake. Um, but, but people have said that before and people haven't acted on that in, in, in these various countries. Uh, in this case, because I think the ownership of the model, they realized this was their model and they realized that was missing. Um, they had not, they had spent a lot of time talking about maternal mortality, but not neonatal mortality. Um, and, and in that case, they, they were then able to, um, they, they realized that and they designed an initiative to address neonatal mortality in the community, including investment from, from, from the government. Um, and they had the, the sort of more, I guess, the sort of more complex pieces there also with the group. But if you know about Honduras, there's also an election that happened. And there was an, I mean, this is not a, the stakeholders are going through an, um, an election period. Um, so the fact that they were able to sort of both see that omission, so gain an insight, this has been excluded from the system, own that, is, and then make that investment um, and commitment to include that was another kind of sort of, I would say, a system insight that came from that process. Um, what's interesting was it was not something that came because it was in the model, but it did come from the fact that they had ownership over the model and saw that omission and could correct for that. So that's my m most recent favorite story. Oh, Peter, I've learned so much from you the past uh, 24 hours. So I have uh, one question. We're, so last night we were talking about um, policymakers. Um, so that would be a sort of a different type of community. Um, and um, I'm just wondering how that would be different, um, how that kind of model building would be different as opposed to working with people in the community. And I'll, I'll just give you an example just to sure. you know, So in, in Soweto, there uh, used to be a community of really abject poverty, but the South African government invested a lot of money in, in Soweto, um, but it was mostly driven by the uh, policy makers and city planners, civil engineers, people like that. And so I'm wondering if, if um, you know, if they had to approach the community and approach the policy makers, I don't know if they've been done separately, because at the community level, like you showed earlier, you can get really into the, the, you know, the richness of the community life that policy makers may not be able mm -hmm. to figure out. Um, so would you go about it separately and then bring it together, or would you do it all at once? We, we've done it a couple of different ways. Sometimes we've had different stakeholder groups. So we might have, like, uh, in some work we did with the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, looking at, at underbanking and use of, of payday loans and check cashing in low-income communities. We had several groups with, low income, with residents from low-income communities. Then we also had groups with um, bank managers and then um, essentially proxies from people who had been in the, who had formerly been in the payday loan industry in Missouri. Um, so we, we first met with them separately. Um, and in that case, the, you, arguably the policy makers were the Federal Reserve staff that were participating on a project and, and so forth. And then we brought them together. In other cases, um, like I mentioned, um, the, um, Raising St. Louis project, looking at early child and what does it take to raise a child in St. Louis. In that case, we we had um, we had um, 
the, so the, the, the people who would be the policymakers would be the people designing the program. So they, were, they participated in one set of sessions and they observed the community sessions and had a chance to sort of respond. And then that was actually facilitated, co-facilitated by an alderman, elected official, who, who was very enthusiastic about, um, who saw, he, he got excited both because it was his constituents, but the problem he saw this sort of solving was he was getting approached with all kinds of problems that he couldn't actually solve. And he needed the community to understand they were part of this system as well. And he could help, he could work with them, but he, it wasn't just, my neighbor's too noisy, just report it to the alderman and they're gonna fix it. So he liked this approach and took a much more active lead. Um, in some cases, like in India, um, we have started working, uh, sort of gained interest in, in, in um, um, with uh, people who are more working at the district collector le level. So finding somebody who's a policymaker, who's innovative, um, that's also true probably in, in, in some places, like we were talking about Singapore yesterday. Uh, where you have some folks who are sort of pretty enthusiastic, so it 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 does vary, um, and 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 the, one of sort of the questions is how do you bring them together? What's the political context? Um, um, I think generally speaking, though, what we try to do initially is make sure each group is in a. We we try to invest first in sort of learning and make sure that's a safe learning environment where people can sort of save face and they're not in conflict. So one of the reasons for not bringing community members and policymakers together immediately is that the policymakers might be pretty defensive in what they hear or, or not want to do that. And, and wouldn't want, they'd want to save face in front of, of community members. And so we probably have separate sessions for that. And I should mention that, that folks like Jack Venix, for example, um, we, we would normally go in and, and work with the community in the way I've been describing. But there are other approaches where you might do initially a set of key informant interviews uh, and you might sort of first do key informant interviews with policymakers and understand their perspective. Then out of that, select who you might want to recruit into group model building. So that's another approach. It's a little bit easier to start off if you don't know the context or, or the receptivity to the approach. Okay, I think we're at the uh, end of our, our half hour, but okay. um, we very much appreciate hearing about your very innovative work. Um, you know, it's been and it's great just listening to uh, your talk here in the seminar, but also having a chance to meet with you throughout today and, and yesterday. And I think you're doing very important work to take the field of modeling and system dynamics and really integrating it into the community. Um, we feel that your work is, is, is uh, continuing to have important impact and will have great impact in the future. So thank you again for, for you. visiting with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.